Well, today we discussed perhaps the most confounding crime in history, the assassination of JFK in Dallas. With us is journalist Anthony Summers. He's the author of Not in Your Lifetime, 50 Years On, Weighing the Evidence. And he joins us from Ireland. Is that Cork County, Anthony? No, County Waterford, next door. County Waterford. Because I always see the Cork County and the crossword puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have you with us. Um, good to be with you. I always th- enjoy, enjoy doing um, any part of NPR. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So 50 years later, we still have more questions than answers. How does this book that you've written differ from your original publication in 1980, and why have you turned your attentions back to the case? Well, it is, as you yourself have said, it's it's one of those things that won't go away. I've wanted it to go away, and perhaps the best way is to start where where I started on the case. At At the very moment that it happened, I was at Oxford University as a student, a young student of 18, pulling pints in the bar with the time difference. It was early evening in the UK. Um, and I got a call that evening from the editor of the then major current affairs program in the UK, for whom I'd been moonlighting to make some money and because I had grand ideas of myself as a reporter, um, in the vacations. And he said, could I join a team uh, to go to Dallas on a plane that he was chartering out of Heathrow Airport. Well, can you imagine that kind of offer at the age of 18? Um, I said, of course, yes, and got ready to leave, only to be stopped by a phone call from his assistant to, to say that they'd found somebody with more experience. So I didn't cover that first huge story, and I stayed away from it like the plague for a very long time certainly during those years um, in the late 60s, the, what I call the Jim Garrison years when the district attorney in New Orleans was running that circus of, a, of an investigation. Um, Is that why you stayed away from it? Yes, yes, because I thought it was a, um, the kind of, kind of thing in which a journalist's reputation would disappear without trace. There were so many clowns involved in that whole thing. And I let, later met the man himself, and he really was the ringmaster, and not a reliable person in any way. So I stayed away from it, and I was busy covering conflicts, um, Vietnam and the Middle East and so on. And then come 1979, I learned from a colleague in Washington that the House Assassinations Committee, the second official investigation, um, was likely to come up with a conspiracy finding. That, of course, was a reversal of the the Warren Commission finding that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin with no further complexity to it, really. And I made a documentary for the BBC. And in the course of the documentary, I was really shocked to find that American media had really covered the story very poorly. Of course, they covered the the tragedy, the event, and so on. But then after that, when the first investigation was proceeding, there were no Woodward and Bernstein digging into this story. And one can tell that, I think, for those who who have my book, Not In Your Lifetime, by looking at the end of it in, in the source notes. There were hardly any references to major newspapers, which is very bizarre indeed, and I... I felt that what I'd done deserved much more than the documentary, and so for my sins, I plunged into it and wrote a book, and somehow, to go to your question about what's different, somehow I escaped at that that point um, being dubbed a conspiracy theorist, which I'd feared, and then I revisited it when literally millions of pages of documents were released under a uh, Clinton records law designed to pry material on the case out of the National Archives and out of the agencies. And a lot of stuff spilled out that hadn't been there before that changed material that was in the book. And also by that time, I was a bit more grown up. Uh, we're talking late 90s now. Um, I was a bit more grown up and, and some things had become much clearer. 
So I cleaned the book up and, and dropped things that were surplus to requirements. And then because it's the 50th anniversary now, my publisher asked me if I would re revisit it again. And I did so willingly because I think this is the moment at which the case is going to sort of topple over into out of current affairs and into history. And that there was a sort of, sort of a duty, if it doesn't sound too quixotic and idealist, a sort of a duty to do so. Um, and I did a little more research and, and um, that, that all seemed, that, that led me to think even more that the job needed doing. So we have now, um, I, I think, a very different book from the book that I originally wrote. So bottom line, was there a conspiracy to kill the president or did Oswald act alone? I think anybody who really knows about this case knows that the one thing that we don't know um, is, is, is an answer to that question. The thing was so badly done at the beginning, so badly investigated medically at the autopsy and afterwards in the course of the Warren Commission, and then cluttered up um, with all sorts of stuff in the years that followed, some of it just gossip and rumor. I alluded to the New Orleans investigation of Attorney General. Uh, of uh, District Attorney uh, Jim Garrison, that that the, the the whole thing has been sort of coated with fog. And what, what I've tried to do in in this book is not to come out with it's a conspiracy or it isn't a conspiracy, because that is an unanswerable question. Um, I, if you, it seems to me we're going quickly, rather early on in this conversation, to to what I think about it, mm -hmm. um, if you ask me what I think about it, I think that there is real reason for doubt that the Warren Commission account of Oswald, the lone assassin, um, with no other complications at all, um, is, is, is the real story. I think it's more complex than that. I think that Oswald undoubtedly was guilty of something that it wasn't necessarily being on the sixth floor behind a gun that day, and um, that very likely, as the House Assassinations Committee concluded, that there was someone else involved. Now, Oswald was a disturbed loner. He was goofy enough to want to move to the Soviet Union. He was a wife beater, a Marine sharpshooter, why would he need any help from, from anyone else? And he also narrowly missed shooting General Edwin Walker, who was a, a, a virulent uh, Kennedy hater. Well, you made a string of statements there. <laughs> um, and one could pick them off one by one. Um, he well, go ahead. wasn't a particularly good marksman um, in the Marines, but he, he was nevertheless a marksman several years, bef we're talking four or five years before the assassination. Um, whether he was a wife beater or not, um, and I don't know from the good information we have that he clearly was such a wife beater, that doesn't make him a presidential assassin. Right. Um, but just going to Oswald, the evidence about him and about him being involved in the assassination is as the assassination committee established they're, they're certainly shaky and we could go into detail on that but the key troubling thing that is, should be raised always about Oswald is that he had no motive the Warren Commission couldn't find a motive for him um, he didn't seem to have done it uh, as sometimes people claim in order that he'd be famous or infamous um, celebrated as the man who killed the president, because on the contrary, in the hours that he remained alive until he was shot by Jack Ruby, uh, he said, he did not say, yes, I did it. He said to the contrary, no, I didn't. Um, and I, I've been framed and I will be able to show how I've been framed. I'm not saying that he, he's being truthful there. And, and the, I'm certainly not saying that he was innocent, innocent of anything at all. But there are major unanswered questions, and there always have been, uh, about Oswald. 
Do you believe that he was framed and by whom? Or what does you what do what have you discovered in your research? Forget what you believe because I realize you just um are not taking uh, a stand I won't take the bait on that. No. Right. Uh, because I think nobody who knows anything about this case will give sure answers and and the re- you, you can't give sure answers because the the, the mess we, we have been left with in terms of reliable information is such a muddle. Uh, I sorry what what was your your it, well I when first? the the idea that he was framed that he said he was oh, framed the idea that he's just framed um that that's his his claim i didn't say that i lean necessarily towards that right. i think that he was clearly involved in something that day he may and it seems likely that he did he may have shot the policeman who was shot in the hours um after the assassination of the president tippet um, as for being framed, there is a very interesting but complex, even for an NPR lengthy radio conversation, um, series of events that occurred in the weeks before the assassination. Okay, we're going to um, just stop right there because that's yep. what we want to get to. We need to take a break. On today's Topical Currents, we're speaking with Anthony Summers. He's an award-winning author, a BBC journalist. He covered events in the United States and wars in Vietnam and the Middle East. And his latest book is an updated version of Not in Your Lifetime, originally published as Conspiracy, 50 Years on Weighing the Evidence, the defining book on the JFK assassination. Let's take that short break and we'll come and pick it up where we left off. And 20 minutes past 1 o'clock, it is today's Topical Current. Joseph Cooper, Bonnie Berman, we're joined by journalist Anthony Summers. We're talking about his book, Not in Your Lifetime, which covers the events surrounding the assassination of John F. Kennedy. If you'd like to join in, I'm sure many of you do, (laughs) 1-800-743-9576, 1-800-743-WLRN. And also email, that's radio at wlrn.org. Radio at wlrn.org. Anthony Summers, I recently finished a book called Dallas 1963, which very graphically paints the picture of the of, of Dallas and what was going on. It was a big haven for very radical, radical right-wingers, the John Birch Society and segregationists. Of course, the Dallas Morning News was published by a man named Dealey, and Kennedy was killed, oddly enough, in Dealey Plaza. Could you comment on that? What what the well, atmos- I think there's the atmosphere yes, in Dallas. I, I think, and of course, there was a suggestion early on that, well, a suggestion even before he left Washington, uh, that Dallas was a dangerous place to go to. Um, there was an awareness of danger, certainly of political danger, if not danger from somebody or some bodies behind a gun. But I've seen absolutely no evidence over the years that right-wingers in Dallas, um, uh, who were simply of of the right in in Dallas, were responsible in any way for the assassination. Um, Before the break, uh, you were asking me um, um, what what I thought had happened. Right. I think it's a longer conversation, but... um, Essentially, one can rule out many things, but one cannot rule out the possibility that there was a conspiracy behind the assassination. And if there was, I think that it came from the direction of the anti-Castro people. The key to understanding the Kennedy assassination at any level, even if you think Oswald did it, is Cuba, uh, an entire generation um, of people were misled by the Oliver Stone movie JFK, which somehow suggested that that it was to do with with Vietnam and the military industrial complex, and that that was a disservice because there is absolutely no evidence that that was the case. On the other hand, there is good evidence that in some way it involved Cuba. At its simplest, if you believe the Warren Commission version, um, Oswald. Um, was had capered in, in public um, as a pro-Castro leftist 
and one could say that because there were at the time ongoing plans and plots by the CIA and the anti-Castro exiles to kill Fidel Castro, um, that it was Fidel Castro um, who struck first. Um, one could say that. I don't think the evidence supports that. But on the other hand, one could say that the anti-Castro people, uh, which includes not only the exiles, people, extremists among the exiles who felt they'd been betrayed by Kennedy, but also um, elements of organized crime, more simply U the U.S. Mafia, um, were involved in the assassination. In losing Havana at the time of the Castro Revolution, um, the organized crime people had effectively lost a place as valuable, maybe more valuable at the time, than Las Vegas. And they were under unprecedented pressure from the Kennedy Justice Department of a kind that the organized crime in the United States had never known before. Um, there was a shared motive there, and the principal suspects, indeed, of the House Assassinations Committee, the second official investigation, um, w were indeed um, two particular mafia leaders um, and elements of the anti-Castro movement. And who were the mafia leaders? The two that are named, the two ones that are principally named, and in it both by the committee in its report, and uh, and and also very much so in the literature since then, are Santo Traficante, um, who ran, as you people well know, um, was, was the, the key guy in the Florida area, and uh, Carlos Marcelo, who was the key man in the southeast and Louisiana. If you want to join in this conversation with Anthony Summers, please call us 1-800-743-9576. We're looking at the JFK assassination 50 years later. 1-800-743-9576. You can email radio at wlrn.org. Radio at wlrn.org. Anthony Summers, tell us more about the audio business that has been debunked now, that there had been a second gunman. It turned out that the the tapes from the police radios show that that uh, was in error. Could you clear that up for us? I'm not a scientist, uh, indeed a, an acoustic scientist, but the bottom line is that the Assassinations Committee in Congress was persuaded towards its um, conspiracy verdict, not entirely but in large part by the acoustics evidence that it had from its experts that suggested to it that there had not only been shots from the rear, where Oswald was in the, six, the infamous sixth floor book depository, but also from the right front. Um, since then, other studies um, have concluded that the first acoustic scientists got it wrong, and there is a continued to and fro. I mean, behind all this conversation um, that we're having today and, and the coverage of the last few weeks, um, people at home in their cars listening to the radio should know that there is, aside from uh, the what one might call the, the Lupia uh, conspiracy theories, there is a whole company of really decent scholars and very interesting people who study the science, if what I would call the science of conspiracy, both at the level of the, the medical evidence, the autopsy evidence, and so on, um, and the acoustics evidence. And it, it's all, it's, it's uh, in small focus, this, this side of the thing demonstrates exactly what I, I said earlier in the general sense, that the scientists don't agree, the acoustics people don't agree. And I think if everyone was able to live long enough, they would still be found arguing, um, you know, in 50 years' time. And the reason they're arguing is because the information is unclear and doesn't lead to definite answers. Some people say that John Wilkes Booth actually lived along to, into old age and, and wasn't the one that was shot in Virginia. Yes, so, not so my story, on, but of course, it, it of course people still are arguing, and <laughs> there are still people who are debating uh, the 
the Lincoln shooting, and um, and I suspect that they will still be debating the Kennedy case in not just in 50 years' time, but in 100 years' time. Mm. What about these... It, it seemed to have been that way, though. I don't know. I'm not a man on the Lincoln case, although, of course, I've read about it, but um, it needn't have been this way um, with, with the Kennedy assassination. It, I, right at the beginning, this may, some listeners may not be familiar with what I'm about to say, but right at the beginning, it, the investigation was flawed. By law, the autopsy on the president should have been done in Texas. And they do actually have a little experience of, uh, of uh, shooting, um, shootings in, in the state of Texas. <laughs> But what happened was that the Secret Service demanded that he be taken, the body be taken immediately to Washington, and it was removed with an absolute lack of dignity, uh, with the Secret Service holding a local Dallas judge and officials from the hospital up, at the wall, up, up against the wall at gunpoint. That's how it began. So the autopsy wasn't done right there. It was removed to Washington, where the autopsy, everyone has accepted, even attorneys who worked on the Warren Commission, the, the autopsy was bungled in, in multiple ways. And I, I would hope that um, a relative of mine, uh, or a homeless man even, killed by gunshot wounds, would get a, a more efficient auto and more thorough autopsy than, than uh, President Kennedy got. One, one of the great scandals, of course, and people trot this out every so often, but it's worth trotting it out, I think. The the president's brain, crucial to the autopsy, obviously, because uh, he died of gunshot wounds to the head, um, was not, um, that's not the right word, for, not frozen, but was not preserved um, in uh, chemical in the way that it should have been in order that the uh, bullet wounds could be tracked and traced to the, to the extent possible. Um, and what's more, after that, simply went missing. Um, the president's brain is missing. Sounds like the title of a bad novel. Mm -hmm. I wonder who has it. Oh, uh, I certainly don't know, uh, but I did talk to the president's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, uh, mm -hmm. before she died. And it was clear that she, she knew and at some point had had good information about the whereabouts of the brain. Um, there's, there are memos about a container that she was, I think she personally was asked to pick up, um, and I think it was on behalf of, of uh, Robert Kennedy. Um, I suspect that behind that, the missing of the, the, the fact that the brain's missing is not some sinister purpose, uh, uh, but the, the idea that Robert Kennedy, who was absolutely in pieces, not just for weeks, but months and months, even, even some say years, emotionally speaking, after the assassination, wanted to see that his brother's brain didn't become some kind of gruesome exhibit and that he disposed of it uh, as he chose right. Hmm. We're speaking with Anthony Summers. His book is entitled um, Not in Your Lifetime, 50 Years On, Weighing the Evidence. And it's Topical Currents. We're going to take another short break, and we'll be back. Welcome back to today's Topical Currents. Joseph Cooper, Bonnie Berman, and journalist Anthony Summers. His latest book is entitled Not in Your Lifetime, 50 Years on Weighing the Evidence, the defining book on the JFK assassination. We're going to get to your calls, but I want to ask you, Mr. Summers, you mentioned about the millions of pages of assassination records that were made public in the late 90s, and yet <clears throat> you say that the CIA is withholding more than 1,000 documents under national security until... 2017 and you ask why if these records are, why these records are being held back if as we were told Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone assassin so why do you think it is that these records are being held back and do you think they'll be released in 2017 well I can't say what's what's going to happen in 2017 um, but you you go to the the reason that my book is called not in your lifetime I did call it that in the second edition in um, in, the, in the late 90s. But I think the title is all the more apt now. The title comes fr from the fact that J. 
Chief Justice Earl Warren when asked whether all the documents on, of the first investigation would be made public. Um, he said yes, and then he paused and, and said, well, but there may be some material um, that involves national security that will not be released in your lifetime. Uh, and as you say, one, one wonders what there could be uh, 50 years on if the Warren Commission report is, is as clear-cut as, uh, and simple as it, as it is, that Lee Harvey Oswald did it his own, on his own with no known motive, um, and that's all there was to it, then, then why should there now, in 2013, be material withheld um, on grounds of national security? I, I think I have some notion of why some material may be withheld, and it is very interesting. Um, Oswald went to Mexico City in late September 1963, so just six weeks-ish um, before the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, while he was there, he visited the Cuban consulate and the Soviet consulate, apparently in search of a visa to go to Castro's Cuba. They didn't grant it to him, they say that the Cubans say that the reason they didn't grant it was they thought that he was um, a CIA um, agent provocateur, some sort of operative. Now it may seem that may seem silly on its face, but if one sees the enormous amount of documentation on on the Mexico City visit generated by the Mexico visit, and as important the documentation that we don't have, uh, some of it we know has been destroyed, tape recordings um, and um, and photo coverage of the, the surveillance that was done automatically at those consulates um, by the CIA. Um, the, we know that they survived. We know that audio surveillance tapes in particular survived until April 1964. That's four or five months after the assassination. And yet, that they have since been destroyed. Well, why would that be? Reading between the lines, uh, and I think this is I mean, what I'm about to say is, is a careful read between the lines. I think that Oswald was wittingly or unwittingly being used in one of the many um, black propaganda operations that were being run by U.S. intelligence against Castro's Cuba. I don't think that necessarily had anything whatsoever to the assassination of President Kennedy, but that when Oswald was linked to the assassination, there were those officials, certainly in, I think in the CIA, perhaps also in the FBI, who literally ran for cover. I mean, the sort of notion of, my God, we... We, we don't want to have been associated with this alleged assassin, Oswald, in any way. Mm -hmm. And by covering that up, that they've managed to cover up, that they've managed to make it look as though there's something far more sinister being concealed. Right. You mentioned uh, the president's brother, Robert, then attorney general. Till his dying day being assassinated, he maintained that he thought uh, there was a conspiracy. Is that correct? No, yeah, I'm afraid one, once again... Um, it's not as simple as that. Um, what Kennedy actually thought died with him, there's a rather good book written by um, a colleague of mine called um, David Talbot, who's really tried to trace that with the assistance of some members of the Kennedy family, and particularly uh, Robert Jr. Um, it seems that he said, one of the last things he said before he himself was assassinated, um, just after I'd interviewed him, actually. That was a strange and savage time. Um, that he himself said that only when he got it, if he got into the White House, which was, of course, beginning to seem very likely in 1968, would, would he be able to properly look into the case. There's another school of thought um, which says that for good reason, um, Robert Kennedy, who had been running Cuban matters for his brother, even though he was attorney general, he was running um, Cuban matters and the, the secret war against Cuba, that the Kennedy brothers had themselves been aware 
allegedly, of the plots to kill Castro and that it was determined that this absolutely should not come out so that the Kennedy bro- that um, Ke- President Kennedy's brother himself had caused, certainly at the time, not to probe further. Let's take a uh, telephone call. This is George. He's in Weston. Hi there. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, first, um, I... When I when I, I remember seeing Harvey on TV and he said I'm a patsy and then and then he said no sir I didn't kill anybody or I didn't shoot anybody and it sounded totally truthful to me uh, just just his voice and then secondly if if as some people believe LBJ orchestrated this because he wanted to be president or it's it's a mafia connection or it's any Castro connection what would have been the great the great uh, uh, a, a tribulation that would have befallen the government if if the people who some people you know they say they knew the Warren Commission knew somebody knew somebody knew stuff they just didn't want to say what would have been so terrible that could have happened to the government if they had come out and said oh yes we knew about this we knew about that Anthony uh, that's quite a mouthful um, first <laughs> let me say because I think it needs saying there's been um, a lot of nonsense spoken in recent days about the notion that Lyndon Johnson had something to do with the assassination. Uh, I have seen not even one small fragment of anything that you could call evidence or any factoid worth a damn that suggests that LBJ had anything to, to, to do with the assassination before the event. What is interesting, I think, is that this man taking over the presidency at a terribly tense moment. Remember, this was just a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis when it really seemed that nuclear war was about to break out, um, inherited a terrible situation. Uh, According to the former chief counsel of the Assassinations Committee, he learned while while, uh, working for the committee that Uh, The bombers went on to higher alert right after the assassination that fighters took off in in the direction of uh, of Cuba and and of communist Cuba and held at the international line in the in the ocean there and then finally were recalled. It is rather clear um, that uh, not just from my book, but from other scholarship, that what LBJ did was essentially to put the lid on the saucepan to, to it, the, the possible horrors that could come from the thing becoming out of control, suspicion of both the Soviets and the Cubans, actually, that that he, he put the lid on the saucepan, closed it down, and that the effective request to Chief Justice Warren was to keep it closed down. Um, and And this may have been a great and initial statesmanlike act by by Lyndon Johnson, although of course it may, as a byproduct, have had the effect of closing off all sorts of other information that we we ought to know about. Let's talk about another part of the enigma, Anthony Summers, and that would be Jack Ruby. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Jack Ruby, of course. Um, killed Lee Harvey Oswald a day or two later as he was being moved um, from the police station to the county jail and um, the first anomaly on that front is is that um, the Warren Commission in one of its most flagrant pieces of disinformation said that there was no connection no significant connection between Ruby and organized crime Uh, and that's simply not true um, the House Assassinations Committee established that from his birth, um, from his childhood, um, in what had been Al Capone, Chicago, um, that that Ruby had indeed had links to organized crime that went on and on. I he the claim, of course, that he made or his defense lawyers made, was that he killed Oswald for emotional reasons, sort of a spur of the moment emotional thing. Uh, there was silly nonsense like he, he's supposed to have done it so that Jacqueline K 
Kennedy wouldn't have had to come back to to Texas for a trial of Oswald. I, when I was researching this, um, I found I was digging around in, in, in a Dallas station, not expecting to find it very much, but in connection with the documentary I did for the BBC, and I found a, an abandoned videotape there um, that was a recording of Ruby in, in the middle of his trial during a recess. And he, he said in that, he talked in a very funny, sort of weird sort of way, but here's what he said. The only thing I can say is everything pertaining to what's happened has never come to the surface. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motive. In other words, I'm the only person in the background to know the truth pertaining to everything relating to my circumstances. I mean, he really wasn't very good at making himself clear in English. But he also told people in the prison that he'd been framed into killing Oswald, that word framed again, and that he knew who had had President Kennedy killed. Well, one can, of course, say that he, he would say that, wouldn't he, um, in order to shift the blame for killing Oswald from himself. But the short answer is that Ruby, the Ruby side of the affair, like so much else, remains an enigma. We're speaking with Anthony Summers. He's a journalist and the author of Not In Your Lifetime, the defining book on the JFK assassination. And one more short break, and we'll come back and take more calls. And thanks for joining us for today's Topical Currents. Joseph Cooper, Bonnie Berman, and journalist Anthony Summers about his latest book, Not in Your Lifetime, 50 Years On, Weighing the Evidence about the JFK Assassination. And of course, we'll have the links uh, to the book at both the Topical Currents Facebook page and our website, that's WLRN.org. And if you want to join in the conversation, the number is 1-800-743-9576. So I'm interested in this Miami connection. Who is this anti-Castro Cuban exile, Herminio Diaz? And what link did he have, or what did you find in your research about him? Well, this is a new thing and an interesting thing. Um, in 2007, I was still in touch over the years with the former chief counsel of the House Assassinations Committee, Professor Blakey. Um, and uh, Blakey got in touch to tell me that he'd had a contact from an old man in his 80s in Greater Miami, uh, called Reynaldo Martinez, and uh, that Martinez, as he got into his 80s, he, he said he wanted to get something off his chest in old age while he was still alive. And um, we we set up, first of all, a conference call with Martinez to see whether he had anything to say worth listening to. And I sat in, in London at the time, actually, and... Uh, Professor Blakey um, sat at Notre Dame um, and w we had an interpreter because the guy had very little English um, and we talked to him and he described the scenario that, and he did it in a way that sounded to us sufficiently significant that we ought to go to see him um, and our, our paths did take us to Miami and we went to see Senor Martinez uh, in his house and spent two days with him during which the, the pair of us interviewed him how can I put it as as toughly as as you could in, talk to um, somebody who's way up in their 80s and we came away feeling that he was telling us the truth as he knew it and what he told us was that he had been told while in a Cuban prison, he'd been in a Cuban prison for cu currency offenses and so on, nothing very serious. Um, but he had been working, because he was a kind of trustee, he'd been working in the infirmary at a time that Tony Quester, and this may be a name familiar to many of your listeners, um, the, the anti-Castro uh, leader, Tony Quester, was brought in. He was terribly wounded, um, following a failed anti-Castro raid by um, other him and, and other anti-Castro fighters 
he lost an arm, um, he was blinded, and he was having severe trouble with his, his ears, with his hearing. And Martinez, as a trustee, was helping him in the helping him medically in the infirmary, and he came in for, I think, daily or, or twice daily to have drops put in his ears, something like that. And at the time, Cuesta thought he was still very likely going to die. And and among the th they discovered the two men that they had a mutual friend, and this is the name to remember, in Herminio Diaz. Um, and Cuesta said that before he died in the raid in which Cuesta had been so badly injured, that uh, Diaz had said that he had had participation, participation um, in the assassination of President Kennedy. Now, that's all he said. But what was interesting to me and Professor Blakey, having, having heard from down the years so many sort of nutcases and people who said they knew this and that about the Kennedy assassination, that this was the first time in 50 years that one heard from somebody who seemed to tick all the boxes in terms of the assassination scenario as as we know it. You mean with a motive? Diaz, uh, no, D D Diaz, the man that was named as having admitted um, to a, having had a role in the assassination. Mm -hmm. He ticked all the boxes in, in this sense. He was a marksman. Uh, Martinez had grown up with him, had seen him. I mean, he was a guy who, by the time he was 19 or 20 years old, uh, was hardly ever without a, a rifle or a pistol. He was not only a marksman, but he had killed. He'd killed some 20 people. Some of them I was able to find a record of in the, in the old clipping files and, and in government documents and so on. He had killed a former police chief in uh, Central America. He tried to kill the president of Costa Rica, and he'd been involved in plots to kill Castro's predecessor, Batista. Equally significantly, and perhaps more significantly, he had worked for Santo Traficante, the mafia boss um, who um, was suspected by the assassination committee of involvement in President Kennedy's assassination, and he was in the United States at the time of uh, the, 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 the Dallas um, killing occurred. So given the way that it came to us and the sort of source, and we found the source a credible source in terms of what he was saying to us, he had nothing to gain by talking to us, um, we, we felt that this was something that deserved real attention. Um, and possibly may have come closer um, than anyone ever had before to putting a name to a man who may have fired um, in, in Dealey Plaza. And we have just a little bit I just want to know what happened to Herminio Diaz. Herminio Diaz died in the, uh, off the Cuban coast in 1966 in mm. the same raid in which Tony, his leader, Tony Cuesta, uh, was almost fatally wounded. Okay. Let's squeeze in a quick phone call. We're very short on time, but this is James in Pinecrest. Hi. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, Mr. Summers, I used to be one of the counsel to the Assassinations Committee, and I remember working on the Ruby part of the case, and we came up with a phone call from his brother Earl, as I recall it, to Havana, Cuba. And we could not at the time run it out, find out where it went, but it, it came up on his phone records at the Kobo Cleaners in Detroit, as you may have recall. And I'm wondering if you ever came across anything similar. I, I think I, I did come across that, that reference, and perhaps I'm sure you don't want to give your name out uh, while we're on the air, um, but um, I would be glad if, if afterwards or later you could give it to one of the production staff for this program. Yeah, have him uh, call uh, Richard Ives here at the station. Uh, and that would that Richard Ives would certainly pass that to me. I did read something about that at one point. I think it is. Is it not in the notes or in one of the volumes? Of he's the not. On, he's not on with us. Any, he's not on with us anymore. Oh, because we're just um, about I think out of it time. Is, uh, okay. Um, I think it is interesting. Um, the Cuba connection for Ruby, which we haven't mentioned earlier, is itself interesting because it appears that at an earlier date. Um, at the time of the Castro Revolution, Ruby went to Cuba and um, in some way liaised with Santo Traficante mm. when he was in a concentration camp. 
Well, we hope his name was Jack. James. James, that he calls back Richard Ives, please. We've been speaking with Anthony Summers, a journalist and the author of Not In Your Lifetime, 50 Years On, Weighing the Evidence, the defining book on the JFK assassination. Thank you very much, Mr. Summers, for joining us. Thank you both.